Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Museum of American History and our special youth town hall with the Greensboro Four. My name is Christopher Wilson. I'm the, program, the director of the program in African American culture here at the museum. And uh, as uh, many of you know, we, one of our landmark objects here at the museum is the Greensboro Lunch Counter, where 50 years ago, uh, on February 1st, 1960, a sit-in began by the gentleman that we're going to be recognizing today uh, that really changed this nation. And uh, in celebration of that anniversary, we have a number of programs throughout this month. And last night, we're able to confer upon the Greensboro Four the Smithson Medal, the Smithsonian's James Smithson Bicentennial Medal, uh, for their actions 50 years ago. So um, today is another special day where we're allowing an opportunity for people around the same age as the Greensboro Four when they took this courageous step to get a chance to enter into dialogue with them and talk about uh, that moment and what it meant for this nation and the future, in fact, of, of, our, of our nation. Uh, we have a great program for you today and to welcome you to the museum and to get us started, I'd like to welcome uh, and introduce the director of the National Museum of American History, Brent Glass. Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon to all of you, and welcome to your National Museum of American History. I, I first want to begin by thanking Chris Wilson and the great uh, group of people here at the museum. Uh, you know, everything takes a team to make something happen, and Chris has put together a tremendous team of people, and I'd just like you to uh, join me in thanking him and the great staff here at the museum for the work they do. This is a, as Chris mentioned, this is a historic week in this country because we're observing something that happened 50 years ago this week, February 1st, 1960, uh, that really changed the country. And we're going to have a chance to meet three people who were participated in that event, three historic figures, and it's very rare that any of us get a chance to meet people who made history, but today we will have a chance to do that. Many of, these, uh, many of you in this room uh, were, are about the same age, maybe a little bit younger than these men were when 50 years ago they took this very courageous step to, uh, to protest and um, achieve their civil rights. They were ordinary men, ordinary young men, who did an extraordinary thing, and we will learn more about that today. But at this point, I'd like you to join me in welcoming and honoring uh, Joseph McNeil, Franklin McCain, Jabril Kazan, and their families, as well as David Richmond Jr. and Lynn Massenberg, who are representing their f father, David Richmond. Please join me in welcoming these people. What they did 50 years ago as freshmen at North Carolina A&T State University in Greensboro, was to sit down at a whites-only lunch counter at the F.W. Woolworth's department store in Greensboro and politely ask to be served. And when you think about that time in the South where segregation was the tradition and the norm and the law in some places, that was quite a bold and courageous act. With their decision to sit in, they not only began a protest that would ultimately result in the desegregation of that lunch counter, but they also sparked an awakening among thousands and thousands of black American youth to understand their power to come together and to change our country for the better. Their act 50 years ago demonstrates the potential we all have to become active and involved and engaged in our community and in our nation to ensure that we live up to the ideals that are in our founding documents, in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. At the National Museum of American History, we are committed to telling this story and many other stories, that we, and we have dedicated our 
uh, museum this year, in this anniversary year, to telling the stories of freedom and justice, stories that influenced and shaped and changed our country. Now, a section of the lunch counter is on display here, and you will see that section of, of the lunch counter, the Greensboro lunch counter, uh, later this afternoon. But it represents the American ideals uh, that we all now take for granted, but that were not achieved without the, the courage and determination of people like the Greensboro Four. This lunch counter has always held special meaning to me for two reasons. First, it represents the courage and determination of thousands of Americans black and white, men and women, young and old, who understood that racial segregation was wrong and that they needed to do something to end it. These ordinary people achieved extraordinary deeds. They were really part of a greatest generation. And second, the lunch counter represents the determination of this museum to tell the story of what it means to be an American. And this is a story that involves overcoming barriers often overcoming barriers to the American dream of freedom and opportunity. Now, to help us understand and uh, give us a little bit of a, a context for what times were like in 1960 and what these young men experienced, we have a short film clip from a wonderful documentary that's called February 1, The Story of the Greensboro Four. Uh, please enjoy this uh, film clip and please enjoy the afternoon here at the National Museum of American History. Thank you. The next afternoon, the four friends gathered in front of the library on the a and campus. I put on my Sunday go to meet and clothes, my hat, my suit and tie. Frank McCain didn't have time to change, so he wore his, his Air Force blue uniform. Joseph wore his Italian coat. He was dressed to kill. And, and David, of course, had his cap on, his leather cap, and he was dressed immaculately. I had some anxiety, and my anxiety was the unknown. I really didn't know what was going to happen. I just assumed that we'd be plugged on the head or we'd be thrown in jail. But I tell you, the one thing that I was certain of is that we weren't coming back. From the time we left the library until we reached downtown, we were rather somber, silent. I think we're all reflecting on what we were about to do and trying to step ahead of time and project what's going to happen. It was like, this was so down. We are like the four musketeers. We're going to our destiny. When we walked into the store, we wanted to prove that we were customers. I bought notebook and made sure to get receipts. We mulled around in the store just trying to get some fix on where we were and what we're about to do. I was trying to breathe slow and heavy so my anxiety would not get too high on me. I felt my temperature increase. I could feel my collar sweat coming off the side of my face. I didn't have to always ask Joe what he was thinking. We looked at each other, and both of us looked at the counter at the same time. And we just started to walk towards the counter. I mean, without a single word, uh, that's how it happened. And we took our seats. Almost instantaneously, after sitting down on a simple, dumb stool, I felt so relieved. I felt so clean. And I felt as though I had gained a little bit of my manhood by that simple act. And Joe and I looked at each other without saying a word, not, not I mean, absolutely not a word. 
and it was about maybe some 40 seconds, a minute later, it seemed like a lifetime, that the people behind the counter acknowledged that we were sitting. And the waitress approached us. Uh, what, do you, what do you boys want? We said, we, we like to be served, please. Now, you boys know we don't serve colored people here. Why don't y'all get up? And she pointed her finger to the lunch counter, the stand-up lunch counter over there. Of course, we said, we beg to disagree with you. You do serve us here, and we can prove it. We got receipts to prove that. And we bought all these things here. And we just want to be served here. I'm trying to keep myself composed. Meanwhile, I feel my legs shaking. And out came this Negro lady, this color lady. And she looked at us, she says, what do you boys want? We like to be served, please. She said, I'm going to say this to you. You all need to leave here right now and go back to that campus because you'll start in trouble. You know, it's people like you that make our race look bad. You, you got that? I used to wonder sometimes why I couldn't sit and, you know, eat meals. It felt like, well, what's wrong with me? I'm not good enough to sit at the counter and be served. I was good enough to work and prepare the food for others, but I couldn't sit there and have a meal. And that was kind of hard to take. The waitress left, and she sent out this tall Caucasian man who we found out was the manager, Mr. Harris. He said, you know, I don't know who sent you boys, but I pride myself of having a good store. He said, I don't want any trouble. We can see the man is worried. He's got a frown on his face. He doesn't know what to do. Meanwhile, some of the Caucasian people are getting up and leaving. Shortly thereafter, we notice a policeman who comes into the store, and he is as red as your shirt when he sees us sitting at the counter. And he took his nightstick out, and I said to myself, you know, I think this is it. I mean, I could, I could almost feel this hot breath. I mean, this guy was breathing fire. One of the officers started to uh, take his billy club and, and just sort of hit it in his hand. And that was perhaps unsettling, uh, to say the least. Meanwhile, tension is going full speed now. Teeth are chattering, uh, sweat is pouring off like water, I mean, like a river. I can imagine what he was thinking. I know what I want to do, but I, I have no justification for doing it yet because I've been provoked. And once he pays two or three times and do anything, I said to myself, aha, he doesn't know what to do. He's frustrated. McCain and I are sitting at the, at the lunch counter and an uh, elderly white lady comes and sits next to McCain and uh, starts a conversation about being disappointed in, in us. And McCain inquires, ma'am, why are you disappointed in us? And she relates that she's disappointed because it took us so long to do what it is that we're doing. To hear someone say that, whom you least expect, it was quite rewarding. I mean, it was, it was quite calm, it was quite reassuring. When that was observed by other folk in the store, there wasn't much noise anyway. I mean, people had stopped talking. For a five and 10 cent store, it was quiet. I mean, it was more like church service. Curly, as he was called, was truly frustrated. So he finally goes back to the corner and leans up against the wall and is like, my God, won't these guys leave here? I mean, won't they please get out of my life? I mean, that was the kind of expression that he had. A short time later, it was announced that the store was going to close early. Nothing occurred. The police were there. They didn't arrest us. We were shocked. They closed the store. And we said we would be back. I felt relieved. I felt like a great weight had been taken off my shoulder. We had witnessed between ourselves a great transformation. David Richmond said, if I don't do anything else in my life, this is the peak 
uh, of my life. I think I've done my greatest jump. People take on a religion to try to get that feeling. I mean, that's what Buddhists try to do all the time. And here I am at 18 years of age, having that feeling of total freedom, total acceptance. I'm asking myself, what do I do for an encore? It's all downhill from here. On the sidewalk outside Woolworths, a reporter from the Greensboro record caught up with the four sit-ins. The reporter had been contacted by Ralph Johns, a local civil rights activist and friend of Joe McNeil's. The reporter asked us, were we coming back the next day? So we said, yeah, we're coming back the next day. He says, uh, you have backup? We said, sure, we had no backup at all. See? So we went back to campus that evening. We need to get some help. And the way to get help, Joe and I concluded, is to summon those people on our campus who had leadership positions. And we went to the Dudley building as we passed the words. That's where the meeting would be. When we started that little session with all of those leaders, and we spent 90% of the meeting trying to convince them that this wasn't a hoax. In principle, most agreed that night that they would help us. And I can confirm that it was in principle only because the second day, they didn't come. That display um, at the museum really showed, showed me and showed a lot of us the, the, like, the impact that they had. People today, you know, young kids like us today, like, we wouldn't probably be able to, to go to restaurants or even sit with our friends, you know. I would want to talk to David Richmond only because he was the only one that had to stay back in Greensboro. And I would ask him, after staying in Greensboro, after the lunch counter event, how did it make him feel and how did Greensboro change after the event? I think I want to talk to um, Franklin McCain because he was my focus group and um, I want to hear from him what he really felt when he was sitting there all of that days and then I want to hug him and tell him thank you. I would like to meet Jabril Kazan because uh, he just seems to have a big personality, outgoing, and I feel like he has a lot of insight on life and it would be just nice to talk to him. I would really like to, le to meet Franklin McCain. Um, he seems like a very passionate intelligent man who uh, has like a razor line of thought. Almost like there, there's a, a waterfall of ideas and concepts going on behind his eyes. I would like to meet Issa Blair because I kind of can't relate to him because he was the quiet one of the group and he was always the one person that you know was close to their parents and would always ask their parents for something. So I would like to ask, I would like to talk to him and see what prompted him to do what he did? It takes a lot of effort to actually be able to go out and do uh, like what they did over there with the sit-ins, be able to go in despite all the odds that were against him. It wasn't just one snap of finger like let's let's go and do this. It was a process that they really worked for and they really planned and took everything into consideration. I'm tired of segregation And I want my equal rights Segregation did me wrong Made me leave my happy home That's why I'm fighting for my rights 
Oh, yeah, I'm fighting for my rights. You know I'm fighting for my rights. Fighting for my rights. Well, my father, yeah, he told me a long, long time ago. He said, son, if you don't fight for freedom, you'll be a slave forevermore. That's why I'm fighting for my rights. She told me, and she was very brave. She said before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave. That's why I'm fighting for my Lord. I'm fighting for my rights. You know I'm fighting for my rights. I'm fighting for my rights. Well, my cell, it had two windows, but the sun could never come through. You know, I felt so sad and lonely. Child, I just didn't know what to do. That's why I'm fighting for my rights. Lord, Lord, I'm fighting for my rights. You know that I'm fighting for my rights. Yes, I'm fighting for my rights. That's why I'm fighting for my rights. Oh, yes, I am. Fighting for my rights. You know that I'm fighting for my rights. I'm fighting for my rights. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this was the cast of Sing for Freedom, which is one of the several programs we're doing here at the National Museum of American History to commemorate this event and the many others that made up the Civil Rights Movement uh, for Black History Month. My name is Xavier Carnegie, and over the past year and two months, my colleagues and I have had the opportunity to tell the story of the Greensboro Four and the sit-ins to over 100,000 people. And that experience has been wonderful, and we're really grateful for it. But today is special because we have the opportunity, and you as well, to meet and speak with the real people whose story we have learned and told for over a year. I hope the weather wasn't too bad coming in for you, for you gentlemen, but it's really a great chance to, to get the real story straight from the source. Uh, before we do intro introduce our honored guest today, let me introduce uh, one of the gentlemen who has helped to put this together and the gentleman who along with myself is going to be conducting our discussion with them. Um, he is the director of daily programs and the program in African American culture here at the National Museum of American History. He grew up in Detroit, Michigan, graduated from the University of Michigan and worked at Henry Ford Museum outside of Detroit for 15 years be before coming to this museum six years ago. So please join me in welcoming Chris Wilson. And now for our honored guests. Joseph McNeil was 17 when he began the Greensboro sit-ins. McNeil earned a degree in engineering physics from North Carolina A&T in 1963 and then spent six years as a U.S. Air Force officer and attained the rank of captain. He's now a retired major general in the Air Force Reserves. He's worked in computer sales for IBM as a banker for Bankers Trust and as stockbroker for E.F. Hutton. Please welcome... General Joseph McNeil. Franklin McCain was born in North Carolina, but reared in Washington, D.C. Graduating from Eastern High School, he received a B.S. in Chemistry and Biology and an M.S. in Public Administration from North Carolina A&T. In 1965, he joined the Selenese Corporation and now heads its office in Shelby, North Carolina. 
He has worked on the board of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And in 1993, he received the Nancy Susan Reynolds Award for Leadership. He is currently chairman of North Carolina A&T's Board of Directors. Please welcome Mr. Franklin McCain. Jabril Kazan received a B.S. in Sociology from North Carolina A&T State University in 1963, then attended law school at Howard University. In 1968, he became a member of the New England Islamic Center and took on his present name. In 1994, he received an honorary doctorate from North Carolina A&T. Now, Mr. Kazan works with developmentally disabled people for the CETA program in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Jabril Kazan. David Richmond majored in business administration and accounting. After leaving A&T, he became a counselor coordinator for CETA, but his life was threatened and he moved away to Franklin. After returning to Greensboro to care for his parents, he worked for the Greensboro Health Care Center. And in 1980, the Greensboro Chamber of Commerce awarded him the Levi Coffin Award for leadership in human rights, human relations, and human resources development in Greensboro. Mr. Richmond died of cancer in December 1990. North Carolina A&T awarded him a posthumous honorary doctorate degree. Please join me in honoring Mr. David Richmond. Thank you, Xavier. Let's uh, take a seat. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, again, I want to, uh, in addition to welcoming, uh, again, everyone in the audience for our discussion now, um, we are joined kind. online through kind. a live Feel webcast uh, by uh, many other students across the country, as well as we're being filmed by C-SPAN uh, for, uh, for further broadcasts. Um, and so it's great to be able to share the story, not only with the 300 or so of us in the audience, but, uh, but with thousands of people across the country. Um, I uh, first want to move back. We saw a clip from the film, and I should mention, in addition to the film clip that we saw from the February 1 documentary, uh, we also saw part of a program put together uh, by Montgomery College here in Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, which uh, invited students from a social justice class there to learn about each member of the Greensboro Four and think about the questions that they would like to ask of, of uh, these individuals. And you all actually have that opportunity today, so it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity as well. We saw in the clip what happened on February 1st, 1960, but in order to tell the whole story, let's, let's move back a little bit. Um, and move back into what it was like growing up for you before, uh, before you got to college, before uh, you got to February 1st, 1960. Just, I'm going to hear a little bit about, um, about your childhood and uh, what segregation was like. I grew up in the segregated South. Uh, I went to a school that was reserved for black students only. Uh, segregation was particularly demeaning and disrespectful of me as my, an individual. I resented it very, very much. Uh, it was a system designed to make me feel inferior. And I didn't feel inferior to any man. I'd been taught never to 
treat myself with low expectations of my capabilities. But whenever I saw things like a separate water fountain that said colored water fountain and white water fountains, it made me very, very angry. Uh, it was something that existed that impacted my parents. They had to suffer for years under the onus of racial segregation. They were mistreated uh, as second class citizens. Uh, so it affected them, it affected their parents, and unless I felt that unless I did something about it, it was going to impact my children in the future. I too grew up in a system of segregation. And segregation, uh, my thoughts were naturally produced inequality. And that certainly bothered me. And it bothered me even more as a very young boy to see how my parents and my grandparents appeared to be tolerant uh, of that situation. I could not understand that. They were reasonably and well-educated folk. And I thought that this is not the way uh, educated people behave or this is not the kind of thing they ought to be accepting of. And I grew up with what I term, and I think Giselle, uh, David Richmond, Joseph McNeil grew up under the same guise of what I termed the big lie. And the big lie came from your parents and your grandparents. And if you know anything about African American families, parents might lie to you once in a while, you think. But grandparents, never. But our grandparents lied to us. They called themselves giving us the prescription for life and total acceptance, which we did not have. And they said, son, if you want to get along and be successful in this great democracy of ours, there are certain things that you absolutely have to do. One is to believe in the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. The other is you have to accept the Ten Commandments as your code of ethics. And it does not matter whether you're Christian, non-Christian, Jewish, or agnostic. There's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments in terms of how to behave. You have to go to school and get not good grades, but superior grades. And last but not least, you have to do good deeds and good turns for people and never expect to get anything in return or be praised for it. And if you were to do these things, then you'll be accepted and enjoy all the rights and privileges that this country has to offer. Well, it took me only about uh, maybe to, to become 12 or 13 years of age to find out in your vernacular that I had been screwed. <laughs> and I had been screwed because I'd upheld my end of the bargain and it was still business as usual. Uh, no colored here, whites only, when it comes to what we call public accommodations, like theaters, like schools, like libraries, like parks, and everything that you thought was public was still off limits to you. And I didn't like that. I mean, it felt me, it made me feel as though I was less than a human being without any dignity. And not only did I not like it, it made me mad as hell. And fortunately, before I blew my top of my stack, I met three good friends for life in the name of Joseph McNeil, Isaiah Blair, and David Richmond, who really felt the same way I did. And I will take my parents and my grandparents off the hook now. What, what they were telling me, yes, it was a big lie, but they were preparing me for the future they knew that I only had a 5% chance of being successful in this life growing up during the late 50s and early 60s. And if I had a chance at all, I had to follow that prescription. Yes, they lied to me, but they lied to me because they loved me. And they lied to me because they were concerned about my future. Ginger Brill. Oh. <laughs> 
I'll start by saying, in the name of the life giver, our life giver, the compassion, the merciful. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the members of the Smithsonian Institute, Mr. Christopher Wilson, and the director of this institution for inviting us to be here. Um, less of those who struggle, oppression is worse than the grave. Blessed are those who live and die for a noble cause than to live and die as a slave. I was born in Greensboro, North Carolina, on October 18, 1941, to a master builder, Ezell Alexander Blair Sr., and master builder, Mrs. Corrie Lee Williams Blair, first of three children. I lived in 908 Curtis Street, which was the home of my great-great-grandfather, Reverend Noah R. Hedden. He founded New Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Greensboro, North Carolina, in the Wandersville community in 1897. He wanted to be a Jewish, but at that time, Jews were discriminated in the South and in America. They were Caucasian people from Eastern Europe, and he was a brown-skinned man. So in 1897, you had the First World Zionist Conference. And Zionism, meaning returning to uh, Israel, was founded by a uh, man in, correct me, I can't remember right now, but the name of Herzl, he was Jewish. So my great-great-grandfather decided that he would name the name of his church New Zion, meaning New Jerusalem. Missionary go out and save people, Baptist church, after St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. Saying that, his wife, Mrs. R. Dear Harrington Hedden, who outlived him, were descendants of slaves. And so she reared four generations, and I was the fourth generation that she reared. Racial segregation I never liked. I couldn't understand why, because I was a kid, five years old, my skin was brown, why I was mistreated. I never done anything to Caucasian people. And I asked Jesus, hey Jesus, how come you, uh, you know, look out for your people, the Jews, and what about the colored people? I pay my dime at Sunday school every Sunday. Jesus, you owe me something. <laughs> All right. And of course, uh, I went to racist segregated schools. I did not like sitting in the back of the bus. I didn't like going up to the crow's nest three stories up at the Carolina Theater on Saturdays and Sundays. I didn't like um, being called Negro. Um, I didn't like segregated water fountains, colored in white water fountains. I thought the white water fountain was special. I, had, I thought it had lemonade in it. <laughs> and a uh, colored water fountain has chocolate. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of grin and bear it. Uh, we lived in segregated neighborhoods. All the people in my neighborhood were everyday people. Wanderville, which was the oldest community found in Guilford County at the time, <clears throat> which is now 144 years old, it was set aside right after the 13th Amendment of the Constitution was passed on Tuesday, January 31st, 1865. The next day, President Abraham Lincoln to congratulate Congress for getting him out the jam he was in, you know, congratulated Congress and said from now on February 1 would be known as National Freedom Day. We didn't know that then when we sat in, but this had been revealed to my consciousness in the last 50 years. So what happened was I said, I'm sick and tired of this. One day when I was five years old, I heard that a colored woman was thrown off the bus because she refused to sit in the back. When I was seven, the Ku Klux Klan had sent a message in my community. Tell those niggas we're coming through the night, man. We're going to hang some niggas on the cross. I said, well, gee, I hung Jesus on the cross. Something's not right with this thing. Are they going to be wearing, they're wearing white too? That's all that Jesus wore, the angels, the disciples. Somewhere along the line, these guys didn't get the right message. All right? <laughs> my father said, nobody's going to hurt my family. He said, I was in World War II. Now I'm a soldier. Anybody try to take my family out, you're going to get shot. I never heard my father say that before. When I was eight, two Caucasian men came to my house. Your name is Ezell Blair? He said, hold it. 
I missed the blood to you. It's like 1949. He said, why are you here? They said, we hear you got white lightning on your property. White lightning, where? You know, he said, before you search my property, you better have a search warrant. They said, this nigger is smart. And my father said, the only niggers I see in front of me are you. I backed up. I said, Dad's talking to white people like he's the man. He is the man. <laughs> yeah. He had a shotgun. Shotgun. Do it like that. <laughs> he had a 45 Magnum like Dirty Harry with a silencer on it. I said, where did Daddy get this toy gun from? <laughs> he was a peaceful man. I never heard him call white people, you know, you know, Crazy people or devils. He said, there's some crazy crackers around here. <laughs> Polly wants a cracker? <laughs> so let me, let me skip forward what? a okay. little bit. Wait uh, now, I just want to clear okay. it up. Okay. It wasn't racist. Is that Caucasian people called and said that in the South that they were like Georgia crackers. But my father was reared by a Caucasian man when he was 13. When his great-great-grandfather died, his name was Mr. Robert. Um, Ingram, he took my father on as an apprentice in the Depression. Can you imagine? Took this color boy with him everywhere he went, like he was his own son. And in two years, my father became the master roofer at 15 years old. And this man, whom I call my second grandfather, gave my father a chance to become a skill to get an education and help thousands of other young people become architects, draftsmen, teachers, in his 30 year as a teacher in Greensboro. I want to let you know, be proud of our ancestry. All the genes in our body, the good, bad, ugly, and different, and strive to be perfection. That's my experience in segregation. Thank you, thank you. you know, I wanted to ask specifically, and I've, I gotta tell you, I've told you all stories so many times, but so excellent, so amazing being here and just really, really hearing this from you. Um, let me ask everyone out there, how many people are actually from this area? Uh, we're actually born here, actually, us, most people here. Um, well, since we have uh, pretty much a local on stage, I, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. McCain if you could give us an idea of what segregated Washington was like, and it, specifically gr growing up here, because I know a lot of people, I mean, we can't, we can't even fathom what that must have been like. Yeah. Segregated Washington, in its effect, was no different from segregated Greensboro, North Carolina. The big difference is there weren't too many signs inside the district that said white only or no colored allowed or colored only. Uh, but the net effect was the same as in Greensboro, where you would, in fact, see those signs at public, pla public places. Uh, and, and, and employment as well. The district was just as bad as any city in North Carolina. There were only certain jobs that uh, African Americans were allowed to hold. The public schools were, by and large, uh, integrated by law, but segregated by practice. Uh, it, there were only a couple of years where the schools were truly integrated, and shortly, th and that is after 1954, the Supreme Court decision, Shortly after that, there was a mass uh, movement of primarily white people outside of the district into Maryland and Virginia, where the schools are by and large still segregated in spite of the 54 decision. And the district began to become browner and browner and browner. And at the same time, the laws were still in place for fully integrated facilities. However, the practice was pretty much the same as before 1954. Uh, the law had changed, but the customs hadn't changed, and the practices hadn't changed. And in fact, you could go just a few blocks from here, if you know where Glen, o Glen Echo is. Uh, Glen Echo was like lower Mississippi. If you wanted to go to the beach, if you, were, if you looked like me, you wouldn't dare try to go out to Ocean City. Or you couldn't go, if you went across that 14th Street Bridge, it was like Greenwood, Mississippi all over again. Not very different at all. I don't recall anybody being lynched across the 14th Street Bridge, 
But Lynch mentally, yes. On several, that was the standard bill of fare. So the difference between, I would say, the district and North and South Carolina and Virginia is that the district didn't have signs. It had customs and it had ways of doing things. Uh, North and South Carolina and Virginia still had the signs. So in effect, black folk felt the same pressures, suffered the same indignities, and it wasn't terribly different. So moving forward toward February 1st, 1960, you know, you have said, I mean, in essence, you saw through segregation in some ways that there were, there were rules, but um, for instance, at, uh, at Woolworths, they would serve you in certain areas of the store and they wouldn't serve you at the lunch counter. So even as children and certainly as high school students, it seems that you uh, saw that, that these rules didn't make a lot of sense and, um, and started thinking of ways in which, uh, you know, in, in which you could resist against them. Is that true? Uh, it, it was true, I think, throughout our country. Mm -hmm. uh, I think young people particularly resented racial segregation and racial injustice. And, and we were constantly in our minds seeking ways where we can stand up for our manhood uh, as we uh, approached uh, our rites of passage. Uh, it, w it was time for us to stand up. If we didn't do this, then we were deferring it for some future generation to have to do. Uh, so we were constantly trying to figure out ways where we can stand up, that we can make a statement. There were some things in life that are important enough that you might want to put your life on the line for. Mm -hmm. And racial segregation was that kind of thing. It was so important to us as young men to not be afraid, but to stand up and to fight. And even though that fight was nonviolent, it still had to be waged. And what was particularly impressive to me was how thousands of people all around our country from every racial makeup, from every re religious background, uh, found ways to come together and to carry this fight on as one. Uh, we could have never pulled it off. One person could never have done what we did. Four people, we had a fighting chance of doing it. Once we became 16 and 63 and 125 and then thousands, we were unstoppable. Uh, so we had to, it was an imperative that we, we come forward. Mm -hmm. I, I, Chris, I concluded early on that there are certain things that a man simply can't live without. And, and, and one is manhood, the other is dignity, and the other is self-respect. And if you can't have those things, uh, to, first of all, it makes you truly a slave. And it makes you a slave really without any, uh, even a modicum of dignity. And I think that... Uh, the grave holds some relief. That, that was my thinking as a very young boy. Uh, the grave might not be so bad considering what this life is all about and what it has to offer me at this stage in my life. And I thought secondarily about it. <coughs> well, that is one way out. But I'm not so sure that it isn't semi-cowardice to, to do that because then you only get relief for one person. And not only that, you cut your own life short and you never have the opportunity to express and to do those kinds of things that you were probably predestined to do or that you were really born to do. And you also let other folk down when you take the shortcut and, 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 and the uh, coward's way out. So you, I got to the point where I knew that I had to make a difference for in the life of Franklin McCain because I was determined to be a full and a fully respected man and human being. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jabril, I wonder if you might take us through the night before. Um, you know, so we've we've heard that uh, you know you guys would stay up all night talking and and, and what uh, you called bull sessions and and talked about 
you know, okay, what, how, can you, how can you take, uh, take this great step? Can you take us through your thoughts right before February 1st? Well, that evening I was in the dormitory studying hard to pass the exam for my architecture engineering courses, of which I was not doing so well. <laughs> I was going down, down, down to the ground. And Joseph would say, in another month or so, you're going to be carrying a 20-pound rifle on your shoulder, like those guys, ants, marching around the bedpost. Them boys were marching around the bedpost. They were marching. I said, Joe, man, don't say that to me. I need hope and help. That's why I moved in with you. I figured his smartness would rub off on me. And of course, Franklin was originally the original Big Daddy Kane. He was tall, handsome, smart thinking, slow to make a decision. But when he did, watch out, the hammer fell on you. So David Richmond, he was cool, calm, and collected. Three cool cats, yeah. I want to hang out with these cats. Meow. And I was studying, and there was this knock on the door. My mother said, always knock on the door before you go in. Even into my, my dormitory room? Yes, because somebody else may be sleeping in your bed. Oh, thanks. Okay. Hey, easy. I didn't look up. I sensed trouble was coming. Don't come in. It comes Frank. It comes David. Yeah, man, we all ready for the mind. Joe said, hey. What's up, Easy? Wake up, man. I said, I'm studying, Joe. Man, I, I got a hard way to go. He says, um, you ready to go down for tomorrow? Tomorrow? What's happening tomorrow? We're going down tomorrow, man. You know, have this sit down at Woolworths. And he looks at Frank and he says, hey, Big Daddy Frank, are you chicken? Frank says, no, man. I ain't chicken. They look at David Richmond. David was doing his grasshopper. He was a high jump champion. David was always jumping and doing his exercise. Even while he's standing still. Hopper grass, yeah. Are you chicken? No, man, I ain't chicken. Then these guys went around the cadaver. Like you're looking at something on a microscope. Hmm, where did this creature? Easy. Are you chicken? I'm looking down and look up. I said, um, hey guys, listen, man. Uh, I don't think I can do this. I just, you know, I can't. Well, I felt a couple of arms holding me down. I got to go to the bathroom. Oh, can't get up, move. Feet, don't fail me now. I was figuring, I said, listen, I got to use the toilet. Then I'll come back and I'll make a decision. So you're always supposed to wet before you forget, right? <laughs> so uh, I figured if I go across the hall, go to the bathroom, I would escape these guys and jump three steps. I would be off the second floor out the front door and bust a five minute mile, which I can never do in high school, and breathe three miles at home in about 15 minutes. It didn't happen like that. <laughs> and so the guys held me and said, you're not going anywhere. We're going to vote on this. So okay. They voted three to one in a democratic way. And I was the oddball out. You ever been the oddball out? It's like I always says. How come the white ball stayed on the pool table and the black ball always went into the hole first? I was a goofball. And so the guy said, well, we voted. You got to go down tomorrow. I said, can I get out of this? No. So I figured the ace in the hole, I'm going to call mom and dad because you don't do anything without talking to your mom and dad first. After all, who's your mother? You are. You going to do what I tell you to do? Yes, mother. Mother's always right. Yeah, Ma, you're always right. Okay. <laughs> My wife said that now. Yes, dear, you're always right. <laughs> anyway, so we got a, car, a cab or drove out there, and I walked in the house and said, Mom, what do you think we're going to do tomorrow? We're going to do something to shake up Greensboro. She said, well, hold it. What are you talking about? So we explained to her that we're going to be nonviolent. We have a nonviolent protest, nonviolent insistence on equal rights at Woolworth Lunch Counter. It was the people's story, Joe said. And 
uh, Franklin, and he made a down payment on his manhood. And uh, David Richmond said, hey, let's do it. Do it. Do it. Do it when you can, whatever it is. Do it. Do it when you can. Oh, sorry. I thought I was back in the dormitory. Anyway, so my mother said, okay, you know what you guys are talking about. Doing something like this can either make you or break you. And not only you all, you don't represent yourself. You represent our families, our community, our church, our, you know, our, our city. If you all go out there and do it, say and do the wrong thing, all the colored people in this city are going to be in trouble. Plus, it, those of us who are here may lose our jobs. You know? And the Klan definitely may come into the city and do harm to a lot of colored folk. Do you want that? Oh, man. Got me sweating. We said no. She said, well, you have my blessings. <laughs> no, this is not what I wanted. I didn't want to go at all. <laughs> the real truth is, my roommate tried to kill me two months before we did it. It wasn't Joe. The other roommate I had, he was an athlete. He wanted to throw me out the second story window because he kept the window open in the dormitory night. And I was a nerd, and he decided he's going to kill me if I pull the window down. So yeah, I didn't want to get killed twice when these guys were talking about social revolution. And that's what happened. We went back to the dorm, but we didn't, I didn't sleep a week at all that night. That's the story. Well, did, let me, and let me ask this, because you all have talked about um, the, the anger that you felt when you were in segregation, but then also you mentioned nonviolent. We're going to be nonviolent. Where did that come into play? How, did you, how were you able to channel that anger? And instead of going one way that many people would have and saying, I'm going to do this violently, the, the fact that you all were nonviolent, which is what's so profound and one of the things that we're celebrating today, how did that come into play? How were you able to, to go in that direction? I, I, when we say we were angry, we didn't hate or dislike anybody. We were angry with a system that had betrayed us, that did not hold its end of the bargain up. And we were out to attack the system. The way the, the, the operating on the very guise of nonviolence wasn't difficult at all. First of all, we were, we were keenly aware of some of our heroes and, and their successes and how they were able to make successes. Well, think about Gandhi, for example. A uh, little guy running around in a diaper in India saying that he's going <laughs> to kick the British out of his country and gain independence. And you know that he did. And you know that he did it without violence. He didn't believe in violence. And you also know that he gave his life for what he believed in. You also know that the Christ himself created one of the greatest revolutions that the world has ever known. Whether you're a Christian or not, you have to agree that he did it through nonviolence. And that he was successful because we even talk about him today and even try to emulate and carry out his teachings. So for effectiveness, you give him an A+. Plus. We also knew that locally, we didn't have the numbers. Even if you wanted to resort to violence, that played right into the hands of the opposition. And that is something they knew how to contend with. And they would out-violence you, so to speak. And you would summarily lose that battle right quick. If you were lucky enough, you'd end up in a prison cell. And not so lucky, you'd pick your brains off the floor from wherever you started your violence. And we knew as well that practicing nonviolence, we were likely to convince other people who were not directly involved with us, people who uh, were of different races, would see the purity of thought and deed that we were involved in. And as good thinking people would have no choice but to be in sympathy with us and in some cases, join us. So it wasn't difficult at all to be nonviolent. Might be for some people when, 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 when they spit on you, when they, well, call him an ugly name or a nasty name. That was somewhat par for the course during the 40s and the 50s. I mean, you're pretty used to that. So, and occasionally someone spitting on you and people lighting cigarettes and putting them down your back and cutting your clothing and knocking you off stools. You expected that. And 
what the opposition does not expect you to do when they hurl that kind of insult to you, they don't expect you to sit there and take it. And when you do, and just look at them, I mean, they look at you as though you're from another planet, uh, or you're some kind of nut. But it, 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 it disarms them. And they don't continue to kick a source when it's on the ground, so to speak. And you win. That certainly turned into an effective tool. Now, I, uh, what I really would like to do next is get to uh, some of the questions from the audience. I think we'll certainly get into, uh, into uh, some more elements of the sit-ins itself. Um, Xavier is going to join us in the uh, join you in the audience um, with the microphone, and uh, uh, please just raise your hand if you have questions that you'd like to. Uh, Anyone have a question? To? Don't be shy, really. <laughs> right here. All right. What's your name? Akeem Anderson. Okay. And what's your question? Were you scared when you first when you first um, wanted to sit down at the restaurant? Were you all frightened when you first got there? At the oh, restaurant? no. Oh, no. We were not afraid. Uh, we, particularly in the case of Franklin, uh, I was too angry to be afraid. Uh, and if I were anything... <laughs> <laughs> I had anxiety, yes, but that's not fear. My anxiety was for the unknown. What is going to happen today? Uh, that was my only concern. And I knew that it was not going to be good, whatever it was, but I was fully prepared for it and prepared to pay the price. Wait, do we have one right here? Uh, my name is McCabe. Uh, yeah. uh, before I can you know, ask a question, I'm going to try to divert a little bit, which will lead me back to my question. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, yeah. The civil rights was and still is something that we always value and appreciate, you know, in our society. In my understanding, though, there came, you know, a long process uh, uh, with obtaining the civil rights. And that process, uh, from what I can tell, my conclusion was that some exchanges or even sacrifices had to be made. An example, an example of that would be black people uh, were willing to fight to the end, you know, to, you know, to fight to the end, even though, you know, they faced rejection beatings or even deaths, you know, by those who have was right. Considering the fact considering the fact that you were aware of the danger you were putting yourself into and you know, my so my question is what prompted you guys to to want to go ahead anyway and stage, you know, sitting at the Woolworth store? That's my question. I, I would say lifetimes of unfair treatment, of racial injustice of horrible things that we were witness to. For example, the lynching of Emmett Till was so dramatic. I mean, it just filled my heart with so much sorrow that I sort of said to myself, we cannot, we cannot ever, ever let this happen again. And it could happen to any of us. Mm -hmm. Any person of color caught in awkward situations in certain states could have been subject to what happened to Emmett Till. And so... This whole evil ended when we made up our mind to end it. And while we knew that just waiting would never bring about change, we, we had to act. We had to be defiant uh, to stand up and say, these laws are unjust, separate is not equal, we're going to obey this unjust law if the consequences are we're going to get our heads beaten in, then it's worth it. It matters enough to all of us, to that generation, the generations before us, the generations after, as Frank will say, our ancestors, to all those folks, it was on us to act. Uh, and to, if not then, when? So it was imperative that we act. And in terms of fear... Uh, I will say, I'll use the term uncertainty. And the uncertainty was bound to exist with anybody. Uh, the question was not whether it existed, but how we handle it when it occurred. Uh, and we handled it very well. I saw women 
who were 90 pounds stand up against the Ku Klux Klan night after night, carry a picket sign, get cursed at, called all types of negative names, bitches, niggas. They used every term negative that they could to make these women stop picketing. But it did not move them. They came back time after time in harm's way and were some of the bravest people I've ever had an opportunity to live with. So Amazing. when I hear the term fear used, uh, there are people who are 6'5", males, 250 pounds, who do, did not have the courage of some of those females. Mm -hmm. we, we have a question in from live chat now. Okay, uh, this question is from Arcom's ninth grade class in Buffalo, New York. Uh, why that particular lunch counter and what was your thinking about that particular location? Why did you choose it? Go ahead again, Jim. One of the goals of the sit-in movement was to bring awareness to the world of the horrors and tragedy and unfairness of racial segregation. Woolworths was a national chain store. It had stores in San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, Boston, Massachusetts, Montgomery, Alabama. It was everywhere. So we hoped that people who live in those various communities would see what we were doing in Greensboro and offer support to what we were trying to change, to spend their money at another store unless Woolworths and these other national chains changed their policy. So a national store was, was why we chose Woolworths. Now all those other guys, we had to take care of them too. But it was one step at a time. Do the national guys, and then we'll take on all the local guys. Mm -hmm. I might add to that, uh, secondarily, they were chosen because they represented a true dichotomy relative to how they treated their patrons. And that is, you could go to the Woolworth in New York City as a black person and shop at all 44 counters, which included the lunch counter. Mm -hmm. If you were to come to a store represented by that same corporation, the Woolworth Corporation, in Greensboro, North Carolina, or Hyattsville, Maryland, then you could shop at 43 out of 44 counters, and that counter was off limits to you, that is the lunch counter, simply because you were black and no other reason. And we wanted to really show the hypocrisy of that cooperation. Was, wasn't their slogan, um, Everybody's Store? Wasn't that one of the slogans that they had? Pardon? Wasn't one of their slogans, Everybody's Store? Oh, yes, and we wanted you to make it our Everybody's Store. It wasn't the Soviet Union, but they called it the People's Store also. <laughs> and since we were peoples, we decided we owned the store. That's the next level. <laughs> One important thing here was we talked about was being visible when we went down there. We, we, we determined that we would act in a particular manner, like being nonviolent. We would dress neatly. Um, you may see some people carrying Bibles down there at the lunch counter. I see some people with Bibles that 10 pounds of dust on it. I know they haven't read it, but down at the lunch counter, oh, these children are so righteous. They got the Holy Bible down there. Doing an the engineering exam? I don't know if that works. But we had the help of the news media. Now, the news media is the reason why this movement spread, because we had the introduction of television starting 1951. Of course, you can see for me that I was a Howdy Doody fan, number one. And I saw all this stuff on television, like Gandhi, 20th century, uh, who was charged by Walter Cronkite when I was 14 years old. And we saw Dr. King and Mrs. Rosa Parks and others on television acting out the movement in, Little, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and then the Little Rock Nine students in uh, Little Rock in 1956. And the news media began to carry these actions live. They didn't censor stuff like they're doing now. Like you probably see me censored tonight at 12 o'clock. Please don't look at him because the children may have nightmares, you know. But news media is like the fourth part of our government. You must treat them very good. Give them coffee and cake. Give them more money because if you don't, your image will be terribly presented. So that's why we did it. And we studied what Dr. King and others had done with the technique of 
news media. And so when people saw us neatly dressed, sitting at the lunch counters, doing our homework, slide rule, I got kicked out of my trigonometry class. Frank and Joe stayed. But anyway, they said, my God, these Negroes, these colored people are, are scholars. And the Caucasian guys who came in were dressed somewhere like ducktail, they had chains on them, we were gonna kill us some niggers and everything. So many Caucasian people said, oh, that's not the image we want the Caucasian community to be exhibited by. So many of these people who normally would not do anything came to our aid because they did not want their community to be represented in a negative way. No, those white people do not recognize, do not represent us. You know, we are the people running this city and we want this city to be, have a good image. See, the other thing was too, psychologically, if the city of Greensboro, which said it was very good, as Franklin said, had a lot of negative things underneath the surface. But the city movement brought all these things to the surface in any town, any place in the country. So the leadership had to sit down and say, wait a minute. We have R.J. Uh, Salem Cigarette Company here. We don't want to have uh, this city being viewed in a negative light because we may lose commerce and trade. You understand? So the city movement more than just colored folks and Negroes, people sitting in. It was about the entire spectrum of a people, of a city, of a state, of a country, of the nation. Understand? Plus that the 60s were the beginning of independence of African countries and other countries in Latin America. And in Asia, they were looking toward America for the right image. Okay, let me, uh, let me also say to our audience now, we're, we do have uh, microphones on both sides, so if you have something to say, just head up to the microphone. Looks like we've got something over here. Yes, we do. Um, I'm Clara Benjamin, and in the video it stated that you all said that the next day that you went back to Woolworth, no one else joined you from your college campus. And I was just wondering, how did you feel when you realized that no one else came to join your sit-in protest immediately after it happened? Uh, someone did join us on the second day. There happened to be two um, colleagues whom we met as we left the meeting with the student leaders and we just said to them casually what we had accomplished and invited them to come in and support us the second day. Now they were the individuals who did come the second day at noon for the lunch hour and in the late afternoon we were joined by some 12 to 16 other people, but who did not come during the lunch hour. Excellent. We've got another question from email now. And this question is from Aurora and Morgan in Susquehanna Middle School in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. They ask, did you know any of the segregationists who opposed you while you were at Woolworths? Were you friends with any of them? And did any of them apologize later? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, we did know of a lot of the segregationists. Uh, we knew by deed and by, by reading the head of the Ku Klux Klan locally as well as in the state and in the nation. And we knew the names and the personalities of all subversive groups who were directly opposed to the rights of African Americans. I don't recall any of the adversary uh, apologizing or joining us uh, subsequent to February 1st or even during 1962 or 1963. Did someone have a question down here, down front? I saw a lot of hands. What's your name? Jamal. Jamal, what's your question? What, how did you feel clean when you sat on the... Um, the the um, bench thing when you, at the counter. How did how did they feel? Yes. How did I feel? You, clean. Well, not the clean that you normally think about when you go and take a nice shower. I was always clean. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I I felt clean because I thought that in my own soul there were things that perhaps I had not done for myself to feel good about me. Things that I was in control of to feel better about Franklin McCain, I had pushed them in the back or, 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 or just not done them. And I thought after I sat 
And after I showed defiance and broke a bad custom, I thought that uh, that was the beginning of the right kind of thing to do. And all of those sins of omission that I had, com had, had, uh, com had done in the past were suddenly starting to come off me, uh, come out of my mind, come off my shoulders, and not be a real burden to me anymore. So I felt, hey, I'm cleaning myself of all this old baggage, of all these old thoughts, all these old concerns. They're coming off. So I'm cleaning up. We say, oh, happy day when Jesus comes. Wash our sins away. Wow. Oh, happy day. We have another one on this side. Say your name. My name is Savon. You have Copeland. to speak really close. My name is Savon Copeland. And I wanted to ask you, were you fighting for, like, black rights? Or were you fighting for, like, equal? For so, so for equality. So, so just for uh, black rights or for equal rights for everyone? I we were fighting for human rights. Yeah. And that included everybody. Great. I do want to get through as many of our questions as we can in the short time that we have left. So um, let's move to our next question. Quickly. All right, right here on the side. Go ahead. Okay, um, I'm Leah Hammond. And while other people who were searching for the same sort of justice were using means of violence and other methods, what did you think that you guys, did you have any doubts ever that you would accomplish anything by simply sitting down? Simply sitting down, we thought, was a way, it was, it was passive resistance. And it was a kind of fighting back that people weren't used to, nor did they have a defense for. And it was frustrating to them, and it was victorious for and to us. It was a surprise. Mm -hmm. The concept you probably seen Kung Fu is about mental over physical. And so what happened, the philosophy of nonviolent resistance to evil is based upon the concept of to trip the opposing force, to redirect it. And the people who were using violence uh, were confused because naturally you're supposed to defend yourself or attack your attacker. Like when everyone is born in the world, they usually smack you on the butt and you breathe in. My teacher, Dr. Wendy Abimbola from Nigeria said, when we're born in this world, we're born into a violent world. And every creative being, whether it be a human being or a gnat or a fly, wants to survive. So when it's attacked, it's going to attack back for the survival. For the law of the jungle is, according to Mowgli, the jungle boy is, you only kill to eat or to keep from being eaten. Do you understand? Okay? <laughs> so that is a natural thing. No organism wants to die. Okay, let's... Uh, maybe we have we'll another... E we have a question from email now. Oh, email. And this question is from Katie R. in Galveston Independent School uh, District in Texas. She asks, what suggestions do you have for young African-American students today when they feel that they are discriminated against? How would you handle it? That's a great question. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I would say, first of all, we should all be respectful. Uh, respect starts with ourselves and, and how we project to others, uh, but pride and self-respect is so important. And then the next thing is to be respectful to others. Uh, when you sense that you are being treated differently based on your race, it is so important to speak up and, and share your views, share your perspective. Uh, we need to communicate. Uh, today, uh, it's different. We don't go to the streets and march like we used to. Uh, there are laws on the books that say that racial uh, discrimination is against the law. So we ought to take advantage of those remedies where they exist and uh, use the law to, to preserve and defend our constitutional rights that we fought so hard to make sure that we have. 
Uh, so let's never give up. Uh, let's take on, like Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is justice everywhere. So things that happen in our community, in our schools, in our churches, in our world, we all ought to be concerned about. I might add also that uh, uh, people who observe people being discriminated against have a, 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 a responsibility as well. You, if you, even if you're not being discriminated against, you are obligated as a fellow human being to stand up, point it out, and help to seek relief for that person or persons who are being discriminated against. That is your responsibility as a decent human being. Mm -hmm. All okay. All also, I would like to add that we must be ever vigilant to protect the rights of ourselves as well as others. Going back to the great commandment of Yeshua HaMashiach called Jesus the Christ, he said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love, meaning respect one another. By this shall all men, meaning minds, know that you are my disciples, if we have love and respect one for another. Who is my neighbor? Well, my neighbor is myself. Life consciousness is not owned by any of us. Think about who your neighbor is. Everyone that has life consciousness in and out of this room is really our neighbor. When the body goes, the life consciousness, which you call me and you and I, returns to its source. We are all our neighbor. You got it? All right. Well, that's that science. <laughs> that's all the time we have for now with questions, everyone. We want to thank everyone. Please give yourselves a big hand. Thank you so much. Now there's, there's one more, one more thing we'd like to, uh, we'd like to do. Um, we, uh, we started uh, this program, or the, the um, interview part of this program, with a song, uh, the song uh, Fighting for My Rights, the Freedom Song. Um, we have, uh, uh, have, have talked a, a bit about, about the, how students change the civil rights movement. One of the ways that they did was, uh, was uh, inventing a new use for music during the movement. Music was an incredibly, incredibly powerful tool uh, during the civil rights movement, uh, just as uh, nonviolence was, and it really worked along with the nonviolent tactics that, uh, that these gentlemen practiced. So we wanted to end this program uh, with the anthem of the civil rights movement, the song, We Shall Overcome, and Xavier's going to lead us in that. All right, everybody stand up. Come on, stand up, everyone, together. And join hands with the person next to you, if you will. All right, is everybody ready? All right. Yes, join hands. And let's sing, We Shall Overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. shall overcome someday. Yes, we'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand someday. shall overcome someday. 
Excellent, everyone. Once again, we shall overcome. We shall. Deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday. Excellent. Let's give a hand to our guests, our esteemed guests. Thank you for coming. I'm going to uh, ask um, our, uh, our ushers to help us uh, exit from the auditorium, and I will um, release, uh, ask the schools to leave uh, by name, and we will be heading up to, the gentleman will be heading upstairs to, heading upstairs to the Greensboro lunch counter, um, and you can take photos up there and, and get to talk with them a little bit more. Okay, and please keep your classes together. Camp. We're going to start moving from the back. The ushers will head us up from the back.